Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, from time to time, I like to go study the swings of golfers who have had great history uh, on tour. Uh, not just flashes in the pan necessarily, but golfers in the Hall of Fame uh, because their technique was not just rocky up and down where they might have been flavor of the month, but lasted throughout a whole career spanning decades. Now the golfer we're gonna look at today if you had never heard of him before and you just watched him swing, knowing everything you've probably learned lately, watching great slow-mo videos of good swings on YouTube, you'd probably call this guy, or at least the swing, you'd probably call it a, a hacker swing. So how on earth did this hacker swing win dozens and dozens of tournaments and three majors wind him up in the Hall of Fame? Well, let's find out who it is and let's take a look at a swing right after this. All right, so maybe you figured out from the thumbnail, the, through the silhouette I left there, the breadcrumbs I left you there, that the, the golfer in question we're talking about is Hale Irwin. Now, Hale Irwin, you'd never put him on your list of pure golf swings to study. Never put him on your list of guys with power like a Bryson DeChambeau or a Fred Couples or a Payne Stewart. He was an extremely short hitter. And his swing was, well, not something you would try to copy or try to coach today. As you'll see as I play this slow-mo video for you, you'll see that he does a lot of stuff that a lot of you at home do that we always talk about on this channel as being suboptimal and yet he figured out how to make this work for him to incredibly well. And not only that, it held up for him um, so well that he won, I think, 22 PGA events, three U.S. Open. So uh, name on one hand all the golfers in history that have won three U.S. Opens. It's a very small list. So while Hale was short, what he was very good at was hitting fairways. So he hit, he was up there probably with Calvin Pete back in the 70s and 80s for most fairways. He was almost always above 80% fairways. And so this was definitely a tried and true method for him for hitting the ball extremely straight where he wanted to. Not only his success on the PGA Tour was fantastic, but he followed it up with even greater success on the Senior Tour where he won another couple dozen tournaments and today still remains the all-time winningest senior player in history, the most victories. So he pretty much dominated uh, the senior tour for 10 years, all throughout his 50s, all the way to 60 years old. Uh, he was still an incredibly powerful force on that tour. Now, the characteristics you'll notice that I generally don't, I try to teach you not to do, which is really fun, is that he definitely is a humper or a early extender stand up, or he does that quite significantly during his swing. And subsequently, his swing plane is very, very vertical or steep. And outside in. So what makes this swing work so well for him? Uh, well, it's interesting. And this is where you get into a conversation about do I need to fix my swing or not? Or is it going to work for me? And maybe I just need to learn to score with the swing that I have. I need to learn my strengths and weaknesses, the shots I can't pull off, and where I need to shine in order to beat other players to cover up my weaknesses. So 83% fairways is going to help, even though he was averaging approximately 30 yards shorter than the longest players on tour at that time. Now today that would probably translate into closer to 40, maybe even more than 40 yards from the top guys in the distance category. He'd be really distance challenged these days, maybe more so than in those days as the courses are really stretched out a long way. You can see at impact, and Trackman would have him being really leftwards with his plane and really downwards on a driver. You'll see him repeating this uh, impact zone in super slow motion, how he really is cutting 
down and across at the moment of impact. So why is this swing working for him? Well, again, he didn't try to make sh hit shots that he didn't have. He generally played a little bit of a pull fade all the way around the golf course. He didn't really try to curve it the other way very often. If a flag was on the left, he just didn't really go for it. He just tried to put it in the center of the green and not try to work against the grain. And so that's one lesson f for you out there is find a shot that you can hit with your swing pretty steadily, whether it's a straight ball, a pull fade, a push fade, a, a, a pull hook, and just try to play it consistently around the course and not try to hit shots that you probably shouldn't attempt. It's what he did. Second thing he did, he absolutely had outstanding control of the club face. Obviously to hit the ball in the fairway and that often be that consistently straight year after year, just incredibly accuracy off the tee. Had to make the club face come in pretty close to zero degrees or maybe one degree shut at impact to make the ball fly to the his target every time and so it's another good lesson for us that all the different ways that we can swing a golf club Matthew Wolf something like that to you know Jim Furyk to John Daly going this way a lot of different shapes of swing but at the end of the day especially with the longer clubs and the flatter face clubs club face angle is the key so got to figure out a way to groove that club face to be the smallest amount of dispersion as possible. And that's something he was really good at. And he gave up distance to get accuracy with this technique. Now, what I want to know down in the comments is, would this swing, could this swing work on today's PGA Tour? Or would he just simply be crippling himself too much in the distance department to make up the difference in in scoring and could he keep up with all the long bombers out there because it does seem like there's a bias towards distance a little bit more these days on tour so what we'd want to do is we'd want to take a look at the stats for driving accuracy for the last couple years and we'd want to see well uh, are those guys winning tournaments are they winning majors are they winning money are they going to make are, are they building hall of fame careers like hale irwin did or is this just a throwback to a different time where you could be a little bit looser with the swing mechanics or maybe not as efficient. Maybe it's more efficient. Maybe this can work. So I want to know from you, could this style of swing today, if Hale Irwin's swing and ability was brought into today's game, would it still be able to yield as many wins and as much success, three U.S. Opens and a Hall of Fame career? So I'm looking forward to seeing your comments on this. If you think Hale Irwin and his hacker swing, you know, that's, that's a joke. Don't rip me about that. But if you didn't know who he was, you might think, wow, that's a hacker swing. That's how I swing. I swing over the top and steep and I hump it. And I don't get the results he does and I wonder why. So <laughs> very interesting swing to look at that's not, you know, perfectly mechanically sound like we you know visually appealing like we usually look at i love looking at swings like this because it simply asks the question how much can we vary from that quote ideal technique or stroke uh, before it's simply not going to function anymore so it it applies to you because you you would ask yourself that question again it's is my swing good enough to shoot the scores that I would like to shoot? And in a lot of cases, yes, but you've got to play to your strengths. You've got to understand your ball flight and work with a ball flight, settle on a ball flight and a distance of all clubs that you feel like you can repeat every time. All right, I'm going to get back to work on my ideal swing for me that I feel like I'm going to have the most success for. But thanks again so much for watching. I'm Steve. And as usual, I'll either see you in the next video or I'll see you longer and straighter down the fairway. Everybody take good care.